guys, welcome back to World History 2. I hope everyone is doing well today. In today's lecture, we'll be looking at the Renaissance Part 1. We'll be having two lectures on the Renaissance. In this first lecture, we'll be looking at the major shifts that take place from the time period of the Middle Ages to the Renaissance. We'll look at what the Renaissance is, and then these major shifts that take us from a time of stagnation, which was the Middle Ages. Remember, we looked at that when we ended uh, World History 1. And uh, what's the, what transitions take place to where we go into the next time period of what we call the Renaissance. Stay tuned for the PowerPoint. Okay, class, we'll now have our PowerPoint portion of this lecture on the Renaissance, part one. So what do you think of when you hear the word Renaissance? Uh, many uh, images come to mind, uh, but here's a couple of uh, words on the screen there that kind of show uh, what people think of when they hear the word Renaissance. Maybe you think of a time of great art where you have these great artists with these great oil paintings. And again, this is a, a, a transition from uh, the Middle Ages where art was, um, was a little more primitive and uh, very flat, did not have a lot of perspective. So maybe you think of art, maybe you think of exploration, and we're gonna get in the time period of explorers going around the world and uh, finding new lands. Maybe you think of humanism and a focus on, on human uh, endeavors and kind of a focus on man himself and not so much on uh, the Roman Catholic Church, which was the center of society. Uh, maybe you think of uh, scientific advancements or music or, or religion. You might think of these different things that take place uh, during the Renaissance time period. Okay, so here's the meaning of the word Renaissance. Renaissance, it's the rebirth of learning. It comes from the French word for rebirth. So we look at the Renaissance as a rebirth of learning. It's basically rediscovering the Greek and Roman arts and, and knowledge and ways of learning because for centuries and centuries and centuries of the Middle Ages, the early, the high, and the late Middle Ages, the uh, way of learning changed and it really started to stagnate. But now we have this rebirth and going back to uh, the great philosophers and going back to the other ways of learning and then also the arts. It's a time period in Europe covering the 15th and 16th century. So the Renaissance time period is from the 1400s and into the 1500s. So it's uh, two centuries there uh, for this time period. But we do have a definition of it. The definition there at the bottom of the screen is a period in European civilization immediately following the Middle Ages and conventionally held to have been characterized by a surge of interest in classical scholarship and values. So like I said, it's going back to before the Middle Ages. They, they're they going back to the, uh, the, the Greek and Roman time period or what we would call the classical time period and, and focusing on those characteristics of how to learn or how to uh, create sculpture or how to paint or how to invent or whatever it may be. Uh, they go back to that time period uh, before the centuries of the Middle Ages. So that's the Renaissance. But like I said, the remainder of this PowerPoint is going to be the major shifts that take place. What are the shifts that take place from the Middle Ages to the Renaissance? And, and um, these, are, these are profound shifts. And we'll go through each one of these. We have six on the screen. We'll go through each one individually and describe them. Number one uh, shift is from the Ptolemaic to the Copernican system of astronomy. And we'll go through these in detail, so I'll explain that uh, in a little bit. Uh, but number two is from the feudal system of the Middle Ages to a system of commerce. Number three is a shift from stagnation of the Middle Ages to discovery. We see some shifts in warfare, which is number four. There's shifts in warfare and how wars are fought. Number five, shifts in thought and of worldviews. And then number six, shifts in art and culture. So let's move through each one of these briefly and look at these shifts. Okay, so the first shift is shift number one from the Ptolemaic to the Copernican system of astronomy. And we might not think anything of it today, but this was a big deal back then because basically what it said was the center of the universe is, uh, is not the Earth. And that's what the Ptolemaic system said. The Ptolemaic system said that the Earth was the center of the universe and everything spun around the Earth. But there was a shift to where uh, the Earth is not the center of the universe. The Earth is spinning just as, as a part of the universe. So this is the first shift. The Ptolemaic system was a model for geocentric cosmology. 
That is, it starts by assuming that the Earth is stationary at the center of the universe. So that was the thought period for centuries and centuries and centuries. But that shifts to the Copernican paradigm or the Copernican model to a heliocentric model where the sun is the center of the solar system and then the planets revolve around the sun. And again, this is a big deal. I mean, this is like the, the first time that they started to really um, shift the culture into thinking that the Earth is not the center. So here's two um, diagrams. On the left is a Ptolemaic system where the Earth is the center and the planets, and including the sun, are spinning around the Earth. But it changed to the Copernican system on the right, which that's the sun in the very center, that uh, little circle with a dot. That's the sun, and then the Earth is spinning around the sun along with the other planets. And also the Copernican system, actually uh, in their the study early study of astronomy, uh, they found that the orbits also were not all on one plane. The Ptolemaic system, everything was on one plane spinning around the Earth, but the Copernican system, the planets uh, were on their own orbits and uh, were also not on the same plane. So that's the Copernican system, and this is a big shift that takes place. The second shift, shift number two, is from the feudal system to commerce. And the reason that uh, the shift takes place is that the feudal system begins to decline. Uh, as time goes on in the late Middle Ages, and uh, more people are kind of rising up out of the feudal system, uh, what happens is commerce takes over. And with the growth of commerce, it encourages more people to be in commerce, but also it encourages invention and application of these innovations, which were quite powerful uh, for, uh, for people to use, such as the printing press or something like that. So uh, what happens is uh, commerce starts to grow. So when commerce grows, the feudal system begins to decline. So for an example of this, uh, a baker on a manor compared to a baker in a city. So if you remember uh, the feudal system, you would have the, the manor land. You would have the little village with the little fields, and you would have the mill and the blacksmith and the little church, and all of the people would work the land for the lord of the land. Well, the baker on that manor uh, basically would bake the bread for the people and for the lord, but all the funds all the money that was made would go to the Lord because it was his land and, and his grain and his bread. So he would get all the money uh, for that. So the baker would not be able to rise up out of that station. But a baker in the city is different. Let's say you have a baker in the city and that baker is able to uh, do well and sell quite a bit of bread. Well, they're able to save money and maybe invest that back into their bread baking business and they go and enlarge. Maybe they buy the, the, the building next door to them and they uh, open a larger bakery. And then next thing you know, they're employing a few bakers and the owner uh, is getting wealthier and wealthier. So a person is able to rise out of that station. And this, that was a simple example of just being a baker. Uh, this is across the board in all different kinds of, uh, of industry. Uh, people are able to rise up out of those stations and become, uh, become wealthy. And of course, there's great implication in this. The implication is that uh, people begin to rise up out of their station. You're no longer tied to the land or tied to a manor or tied to a lord, but now you can be your own person and, uh, and have your own wealth if you're able to do that. And as that happens, the feudal system declines. Now that's going to be, generally speaking, for most of Europe and England, is, this is going to happen. But of course, the feudal system does continue on in some areas. Uh, even um, the, the great vast land of Russia, uh, their feudal system will actually continue on well into the 19th century. So it's not saying that the feudal system completely disappears, but commerce uh, really uh, makes the feudal system decline in Europe. Shift number three is from stagnation to discovery. So to the scholars and thinkers of that day, however, it was primarily a time of revival of classical learning and wisdom 
after a long period of cultural decline and stagnation. What happens is the events at the end of the Middle Ages set in motion a series of social and political and intellectual transformations that culminate in the Renaissance. And so we have this, this burst of discovery and and um, of interest in, in moving out and, and really investigating and learning new things. An example of this is the printing press of 1439 with Johannes Gutenberg, who he, he's German. Uh, he decided that he was going to invent a movable type printing press, which revolutionized printing and, and mass production. So before this time, uh, anything that was copied would have been hand copied which uh, was just, it took so much time. It usually the, the Catholic Church was the one that did the copying. Usually it was monks in a monastery uh, would hand copy uh, Bibles and books uh, of a religious nature. Uh, it, some would be uh, printed with a, a large block of wood. So the entire page would have to be carved backwards, basically, you know, in reverse on a block of wood. They could put some ink on it and press it on some paper and you would have one page. But that was, uh, you know, again, car carving an entire page out of a block of wood. But uh, Gutenberg, he did movable type, where instead of having to do all of that labor, his movable type meant that each letter was able to be moved around. Each letter was on a little tiny block. And so you could put all these blocks in a row and create a word and then do the ink and, and the press. And you would be able to um, do different uh, pages and all of that a lot faster. Of course, at the time period, it was still quite time consuming, but not as much as handwriting a book. Uh, so the Gutenberg Bible was uh, produced in 1455. It had, 20, uh, it had two columns of 42 lines of text on each page. And so he was able to uh, produce uh, the Gutenberg Bible uh, pretty, pretty quickly. Implications. It led to revolutionizing science, education, the Enlightenment, uh, ideas were spread, and also the economy. If you think about this, uh, it became a lot faster and easier to do printing. And as uh, the printings went out faster and faster, got into the people's hands, the people would learn to read or they could read or it was read to them. And uh, their imaginations would, would continue on. And so they would start looking into different applications with science or education or whatever, whatever it may be. And the printing press uh, really, really pushed these ideas. And so you see it went from stagnation where basically people didn't really think outside of their little farm or outside of their little area of life. And now people are really starting to think outside of the box. Shift number four is shifts in warfare. And this is basically because of the introduction of gunpowder. Uh, kingdoms basically could not defend against cannons and firearms because of the warfare tactics for centuries were basically foot soldiers against a castle or besieging against a castle. And so now you have uh, knights being replaced by foot soldiers with firearms. And the castles were no longer safe because uh, the cannon could damage the castle walls. So castles, which used to be a uh, quote unquote safe place, you could go back into your castle, shut the gate, draw up the drawbridge, and you'd be safe in there from the foot soldier knights coming after you. Well, now they're shooting cannons at your castle to knock down its walls. So it was no longer a safe place for refuge. And although castles were still placed under siege at this time, so they would bring cannon there and people would hide in the castle, the castle could actually reduce it, or the, the cannon could actually reduce the castle to rubble. Also, there were differences in naval warfare. They would put cannons on ships. And you can imagine that. You can maybe a movie you've seen where the ships would come up alongside one another and just start blasting away at each other. Well, before, uh, if it was naval warfare, they would have to like uh, come up alongside and board the ship and then fight hand to hand uh, there uh, after they board the other enemy ship. But now you can just come up alongside the ship and just blow it to pieces with your cannons. Also, naval tactics uh, in, increased and in how, how you could uh, bring an armada against another large group of shipping uh, of, of the enemy ships and different naval tactics changed. Uh, fortifications began to change around 1500, going from a uh, castle-type fortification to a polygonal fortification, which I'll explain that here in a second. So here's um, just a couple of images here on the screen of early rifles. You see a Renaissance rifle there called the Arquebus, 
And I mean, this is very primitive. I mean, just imagine you're out there fighting a war, fighting a battle, and you have this uh, gun. I mean, here he's lighting the fuse to shoot. Basically, it was almost like a, a handheld cannon, uh, lighting this fuse to shoot uh, the enemy. So here's some pic a picture of the arquebus. But then over here is a musketeer uh, with an early musket. So again, you have the, he still has his sword and, and all of that, but he now has this large gun that he can shoot. So musketeer, you know, get the name from the musket. Now this is a later Renaissance uh, type weapon. Okay, so here's a picture of Corfe Castle in Dorset, England. It was heavily damaged during the English Civil War of 1642 to 1651, and it was actually left in ruins, and it has become a tourist attraction. You can see the tourists uh, standing right here on this little path. Uh, but the reason I brought this up was that this was heavily damaged by cannon. So the people would have gone into the castle and the enemy would then blow the, blow the castle apart with the cannonball. So the castle was no longer a safe place to hide during, uh, during a war. So you can see this major shift. Also, I talked about the polygonal fortification. And so here's two pictures. Here's a drawing of one, and here's an actual of another, and I have another one coming up. Uh, but the reason it, it's um, a very important shift is, like I said, they shift away from castles more now to forts. And what they did was they have walls, so the wall is still there like a castle, but what is behind the wall is what is important. And what is behind the wall is earth. So you have this these walls here, and you have earth, that is backing up the wall. So you see it over here in this picture also where my arrow is. You have these earthen walls. So the reason this is important is because uh, the castle wall, when it's hit by a cannonball, there's nothing behind it to absorb that impact. So the cannonball would hit the castle wall, the castle wall would take that impact and then crumble apart. But a polygonal fortification with an earthen backing behind the wall there's something that can absorb the impact of that cannonball. So the cannonball would hit the wall of the earth uh, the, with the earth behind it, and the earth would absorb that impact, and it would not destroy the fort. And so this would last for uh, a good long time, a couple of centuries. Uh, here's an example of Fort McHenry in Baltimore, Maryland. This was built well after the Renaissance. This is 1776 to 1797. And you can see the polygonal shape, almost like a star, and then the cannon would come from the ship, hit the wall or the earth here, and it would Im the, the earth would then be able to take that impact and it would not uh, destroy the fort. And I have down there on the bottom of the screen uh, what happened here. Well, during the War of 1812, as the British were bomb bombarding uh, the fort, uh, Francis Scott Key uh, saw the flag flying and he wrote our national anthem, the Star Spangled Banner. So um, pretty important, but the reason I brought this up was because it's a polygonal fortification and it's a good example of one that can take the impact of a cannonball. Okay, so now we're going to go on to shift number five, which is shifts in thought and worldview. Uh, we have this term here on the screen, uh, humanism. It's a shift of thought. It's a system of thought that centers on human values, potential, and worth. And during the Middle Ages, pretty much uh, man had stagnated into the feudal system of almost you're just a peasant. There's not much worth or value going on. You you are born, you live your life, and you die on this little farm somewhere serving somebody else. So humanism is this idea of that, that centers on on the human. Humanism is concerned with the needs and welfares of humanity. It emphasizes the intrinsic worth of the individual and sees human beings as autonomous, rational, and moral agents. And so this is also different from the Middle Ages because uh, pretty much during the Middle Ages, the church told people what their worth was, and the church was the moral agent. Uh, now, under humanism, uh, each individual person is autonomous, and they have their own rationale. They can make decisions in regards to their own morality. Uh, humanism was initiated by the educated secular rather than the educated religious who had dominated the med medieval intellectual life and had developed a scholastic philosophy. And that was um, that's just a big mouthful, but it's basically saying that the religious educated people were no longer in charge. The secular began to spread out and their ideas began to catch on and the ch Catholic Church was no longer really the center of society. Humanism began to achieve 
it began and achieved its fruition first in Italy, and then it spread out into Europe from there. Continuing on uh, with shifts of thought and worldview, uh, there's a man named Decidius Erasmus, usually you just call him Erasmus. Uh, he was foremost among the Northern European uh, humanists. He, he was a very well-known humanist. He wrote a book called Praise of Folly in 1509, which epitomized the moral essence of humanism in its insistence on heartfelt goodness as opposed to formalistic piety. He was basically saying that uh, people can be good and do good things, and it does not necessarily have to be um, a life of piety, formalistic piety that the Catholic Church said. And I'll explain that here just in a moment. The intellectual stimulation provided by humanists helped spark the Reformation. Erasmus was involved in the Reformation, uh, but um, it's this, this kind of intellectual stimulation where people are now thinking outside of the box of the Roman Catholic Church uh, really sparked the Reformation. Uh, he was king among scholars in the early part of the 16th century, and he is known as the Prince of Christian Humanists. Okay, so there's a picture of him, the seizure is Erasmus, 1466 to 1536. Continuing on, uh, he sought to revive the spirit of the classical and Christian antiquities and make them a reforming power in the church. And so he actually uh, translated the New Testament. Uh, Johann Froben enlisted him to translate the New Testament, and he rushed through it to get it done in six months. Well, if you rush through it in a translation of the New Testament in six months, it's going to contain errors, and it did. It contained over 400 errors, and it had to be revised in 1522. The second translation that he did was used by Martin Luther to write his German translation of the Bible to get the Bible into the hands of the Germans during the, the Reformation. Erasmus revised it a third time several years later, and this version became the basis for the Textus Receptus. And that's important because that becomes the basis for the King James Version of the Bible. Uh, probably because it was produced first and cost less than it was small, it became the standard text for several hundred years. So that third uh, translation of Erasmus's um, uh, New Testament uh, became uh, basically the standard for several hundred years. So there's two major works by Erasmus. Uh, the first one, like I mentioned earlier, is called The Praise of Folly. In 1509, it was written, but it was printed in 1511 to get it into the people's hands. And it was a satire of the Roman Catholic Church. And it talked about the superstitions and the rituals and the abuses of the church. It was actually written to amuse his friend. Erasmus wrote it to amuse his friend, Sir Thomas More, who was Lord Chancellor for Henry VIII. So uh, Henry VIII, a very powerful king in England, and he goes and and writes, Erasmus writes this for his friend Thomas More. Well, Folly is the name of the main character. And she, it's a, it's, a, it's a woman, she stands in front of a crowd while wearing a fool's costume, kind of like a jester's costume. She's in a fool's costume, and she's praising her own virtues and merits. And when you think of, of the fool or the, the court jester, no one would think of virtues and merits of a jester. The jester is there to make jokes. The jester is there to be a fool. Well, Folly is the main character and is praising her own virtues and merits. Well, what it's doing is actually making fun or, or showing how foolish the Roman Catholic Church was. So that's called the praise of Folly. The second main work of Erasmus is Julius Exclusus from Heaven, 1514. And this is a story about Pope Julius meeting Peter at the gates of heaven. And in this story, the Pope demands entrance based on his works and his reputation, and he even begins to threaten St. Peter at the gate. And what happens is a comical debate starts between the Pope as he's explaining his corrupt achievements on earth to Peter. Well, Peter is horrified at the Pope and the state of the papacy, and he refuses the Pope's entrance to heaven. And that's a big deal because the Pope of the Roman Catholic Church is supposed to be you know, the, the vicar of Christ on earth. He's the, the head of the church. He's the go-between between man and, and Jesus. And here you have Peter saying, you can't even come into heaven because of how corrupt you are. Well, this book, Julius Exclusus from Heaven, is strong criticism of the Pope, of the papacy, the Roman Catholic Church. It also uh, starts to slam simony, which is the sale of church offices. And people would, uh, like bishops, would sell a church office underneath of them to make money. 
It also slammed nepotism, which is uh, where you place a family member into the office. So maybe a bishop would um, place his nephew into um, a clergy position under him, or or maybe be a priest of a, of a parish. Uh, and so uh, nepotism uh, was slammed by this work by Erasmus. And also to ter- totalitarian rule, which basically the Catholic Church tried to control everything. And so uh, Erasmus really hit hard against the Catholic Church. And we come here to our final shift, shift number six, which was a shift in art and culture. It was in art that the spirit of the Renaissance really achieves its sharpest formulation. You can really tell how um, uh, art changed from the Middle Ages to the Renaissance. Art became a branch of knowledge and, and valuable and capable which was valuable and capable of providing man with images of God and his creations as well as with insights into man's position in the universe. A lot of the Renaissance art does have a spiritual aspect to it. Many Bible images are, are painted. Uh, you, 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 this is where you start thinking of the big names like Da Vinci or Michelangelo, uh, Raphael. You start th- thinking of these big names of these artists. Even in science, uh, Leonardo da Vinci used uh, art as a ex- way of exploring nature and recording discoveries which we're going to look here at at a few of them. Uh, Art was based on observation of the visible world and practiced according to the mathematical principles of balance and harmony and perspective, which were developed at this time. And I underline perspective because during the Middle Ages, the perspective was way off. It was very flat. People's uh, uh, limbs were very long and skinny, and uh, there was not much balance or harmony in the pictures. But you'll see in Renaissance art, that is all recaptured, and, and they, there's just very beautiful art. Uh, when I was going for my bachelor's degree, uh, I minored, I majored in, in European history, but I minored in anthropology. But I was also very interested in art history. And so what I did for my minor, um, what I started doing is I started taking art history courses, and I took quite a few art history courses with Middle Age, medieval art and Renaissance art. And it came down to I had the certain number of art history courses and a certain number of anthropology courses, and uh, I needed one more course for my minor. And it just so happened my schedule fit with anthropology and not art history. And I took one more anthropology, and I had enough for that minor. So that's what I did. I minored in anthropology. But um, I was very interested in art, in art history. I almost, I almost minored in art history. Uh, but I know quite a bit about it, and uh, and it's just amazing to see the shifts. So um, we'll have more uh, information on art in our next lecture, but I do want to talk about the great three, the trinity of great masters of high Renaissance art. And this is the trinity of great masters, Leonardo da Vinci, Michelangelo, and Raphael. And you see their dates there, w- w- the time that they lived. So they're pretty much contemporaries of one another. Uh, Leonardo da Vinci is uh, the ultimate Renaissance man, which basically means he he studied many different fields of study, and he was an expert pretty much uh, in in those fields. Uh, so Leonardo da Vinci, Michelangelo, he had vast projects that he painted, and he drew inspiration from the human body. And then Raphael was is known for his harmony, beauty, and serenity of his artwork. And we'll look at a few artwork pieces here, but we'll have more in the next lecture. Okay, so here's da Vinci. On the left is Lady with Ermine, 1489 to 1490, and this is oil on wood. It's a wood panel that he painted, and you just, I mean, just, just the beauty of this uh, woman and the in the dress and the how the hand is painted and just the focus on detail of the muscles, even in the face of the ermine here. It's just, uh, it's just a really beautiful piece, and it's such a transition, it's such a stark difference from medieval art that was just flat. And no, not much definition on any any person. This is well known. Uh, the Last Supper, 1485 to 1489, and this is uh, in gesso. Uh, gesso is a, a type of painting. How how, how it is painted? Okay. Um, th- here's uh, Da Vinci again. Uh, we have the Mona Lisa, 1503 to 1505, and this is oil on wood. Obviously, this is the most well known and most visited piece of art uh, in history, and. Uh, this is stored in the Louvre, Paris, and it's behind many layers of protective glass. Okay, here's Michelangelo, 1475 to 1564. On the left is Pieta, which is 1498 to 1499. Uh, this is a life-size statue of Mary holding the body of Jesus. And it's just amazing to see, just the amazing, the detail of the sculpture, uh, just the folds in the dress, 
and uh, the muscles and Jesus's legs and and his ribs. It's just it's just amazing how that could be um, carved out of marble. And then we have uh, the statue of David. Again, very well known. This is a very tall statue. I don't really have any way of showing the perspective of it, uh, but um, mathematically, it is uh, just an excellent example of a statue of the Renaissance time period that has everything proportionate, the, the arms, the legs, the hands, the face, everything is proportionate uh, for the human body. Okay, uh, Michelangelo continuing here, 1475 to 1564, uh, he painted the Sistine Chapel uh, ceiling, uh, and, and he painted it 1508 to 1512, and you see the different scenes on the right-hand side, and then uh, the the left hand side is God uh, touching the finger of Adam, very well known. Okay, so you see that this is a up close, kind of an up close picture here of the very well known two fingers touching, and that's in the very center of uh, the Sistine Chapel. And then these are different panels that he painted showing different events that take place throughout the Bible. Okay, and here's Raphael, 1483 to 1520. This is uh, the Transfiguration of Jesus. And again, like I said, it's just such a stark difference from the medieval uh, artwork. You see here Jesus uh, uh, ascending there, uh, but just the folds and the clothing and the, the cloaks uh, here, the, the um, images with their different uh, facial expressions. You, you kind of see that there's conversation, there's emotion, and there's movement, and all of this is going on within the art compared to the Middle Ages, which was just very flat and not much movement going on. Okay, so that is it for the Renaissance Part 1, and we looked at the shifts there from the Middle Ages to the Renaissance. I'll see you in a second. Okay, class, that is it for today. Uh, in our next lecture, we'll be looking at the Renaissance Part 2. I'll see you then.